Hey, since I'm underwriting the cost, can I take a bit of liberty with all of you? <laughs> How about we do a wave? It's Saturday morning, come on. It's, it's, a, it's a boring, uh, dreary Saturday morning. So let's do this. Let's, let's try and do a wave to just get started off. I'm going to say Python data science rocks, OK? So all of you guys here on that row, you know, when I say Python, get up and say Python as loud as you can, OK? Great. And this row here, you guys get up when I say data science, get up and say data science as loud as you can. Okay, and all of you here, when I say rocks, you guys get up, say rocks as loud as you can. Okay, and we're going to do it like three times. <laughs> Come on, I, I don't know if you have you ever had a Python conference where you did a wave? No. Let's do it. Let's make the eleven pi data the one where that happens. Okay, Python, Python. Data, science. data science, rocks, rocks. Python. Python, data science. Data science. Data science. Data science rocks. Awesome. Give yourself a hand. All right. That, that's fun. So it was only about four years ago that Mark Andreessen said software is eating the world. He meant software is in the fabric of our everyday lives. But now, you know something that uh, magical is happening. The cloud is eating software. All types of software are being delivered on the cloud as services. And all of us in the cutting edge, like most of you in the audience know, that's where software is going. But there's something else that's happening, something else that's equally important. The cloud is eating data. When the cloud's eating software, and when all the data in the world flows into the cloud, and the cloud eats data, when it digests both, you get intelligence. It's not necessarily intelligence like in the human brain, but it's a kind of intelligence that makes things around us intelligent and smart in so many different ways. So let me tell you what I mean. OK. So once upon a time, all the world's data was analog. You know, two and a half zettabytes of it, books, gramophone records, and all of that. Well, that was not too long ago. It was just 30 years ago. And then uh, client server computing came and the internet came and the digital data exploded and started overtaking analog. So that blue area, that's the digital data that's starting to happen. Again, it was not too long ago. And then the data on connected devices grew. Data now had an IP address. This is connected data. For the first time, data was addressable, okay? The vast majority of the world's data now is completely digital. There are about 10 zettabytes of it. And that's, by the way, 10 million petabytes and connected data is taking over. And this is 2015. You see analog has disappeared, practically speaking, or it is disappearing as a fraction of overall data. And the majority of that data is now digital, and at least half of that is connected data living in the cloud and in data centers. And fast forward to 2020. By 2020, there will be about 50 zettabytes of data, 50 million petabytes. That's data from the Internet of Things, from your mobile devices. It's audio, media, sensor data. And the vast majority of that data is in interconnected data centers, internet-connected data centers. It's in the cloud, right? And that's where the planet's information and intelligence will reside. And by the way, all of that data is right next to extremely sophisticated software algorithms and big data systems. And that transformation is revolutionizing every industry, OK? So when we have conversations with developers about this, about this transformation, Developers like yourself typically want to do about four different things with all of that data. You want to first really understand what happened in the past by looking at the data and doing retrospective analysis on it. Well, then very often you want to actually do real-time analytics on it because real-time data is, in fact, many, in many ways more valuable than old historical data. And you want to know what's happening right now. If you're on the road, you want to know where the traffic issues are, right? Real time. And then they actually want to look at the patterns in the past and extrapolate for the future. And hopefully you want to do that in a scientific way, predictive analytics. And then they finally want to build intelligent apps with it. In fact, most of you really are about building applications that actually take an action, as opposed to just sitting around analyzing past data. And you want to build intelligent SaaS apps. OK, so and all of this in the cloud is becoming dramatically easier and faster. And the best way for me to illustrate this is with a story. 
OK, so I'm going to tell you about the connected cow. There's such a thing as a connected cow. It's perhaps the sexiest story in the world. It's about the Internet of Things. It's about data. It's about analytics. It's about the cloud. But it is also about human ingenuity and how even the, the power of data and analytics and the Internet of Things can show up even in the most surprising places. So let me tell you what I mean. These are the connected cows that I'm talking about. Notice those parameters on their legs. They are actually counting the steps that the cow is taking. They're connected to Wi-Fi. They're sending that data to Microsoft's cloud, Azure. And there's a service in the cloud that analyzes the data. And I have one of those parameters with me. I was actually going to wear it and walk around, but you won't be able to see it. But <laughs> <laughs> so this one, uh, but, but, but why? I mean, do the cows need to take 10,000 steps a day, too? <laughs> Before I give you the answer, let me step back a second. You know, these days, every company is a data company, even the ones you least expect, even dairy farms. Now, for example, dairy farms have all the constraints of a modern business. They have a fixed herd, right, the cows. They have a pasture. They have, you know, food. Their output is milk and beef. And they have to maximize that output under the constraints of expensive farm labor and a fixed herd and the pasture they have. So what's a farmer to do? Uh, what a dairy farmer can do is a couple of things. They can detect health issues in cows early and prevent loss of the herd. Or they can improve cattle production by accurate detection of estrus. Now, if you remember high school biology, estrus is when the animal goes into heat, when the animal is ready to mate, you know, when the time is right, so to speak. Uh, and that's the only time when animals uh, are ready to reproduce. And so how can a farmer tell when the time is right for hundreds of cows in a dairy farm? Could technology help? Could you, for example, build um, a heat map of the dairy farm, so to speak? <laughs> well, to see how important accurate estrus detection is, let me actually show you data from a research paper. You know, this is serious stuff, by the way. Uh, these days, with artificial insemination, the consumption rate is actually relatively high. It's about 70%. It's on the left. But uh, you know, estrus detection rate is that second column. It's about 55%. And if you multiply the two, you get a pregnancy rate about 39%. Now, estrus detection is done by age-old methods, and methods that haven't really changed for a millennia. And it's really, at the end of the day, close observation. You just need dairy, uh, you know, farm hands to go uh, see if the animal is going into heat. And so, now, if you look at the, multiply the two things together, you see the probability is actually pretty low. But well, could technology really help and push that estrus detection rate up to 95%? If you can do that, you get up to a 66% improvement in pregnancy rate and calf production in a dairy farm. And that's actually incredibly materially important to the farm. OK. So, but this is hard, right? This is hard for a couple of reasons. You know, estrus lasts only about 12 to 18 hours every 21 days. And those numbers are very variable. It's not always 21 days. It changes. And when it, the, see, it turns out animals actually go into heat only when conditions are safe and they feel secure and all of those things, right? It occurs mostly between 10 p.m. and 8 a.m., like a lot of these things. And it is hard, <laughs> in some ways, to accurately detect that. So how can farmers tell when the time is right? So that was a question a Japanese farmer asked one of our partners, Fujitsu. And Fujitsu's engineers consulted some dairy researchers. And uh, based upon some research that had been published, you know, starting from about 2005, they came up with a great system for detecting heat. That was 95% accurate, indeed. In fact, it is the hottest system for detecting heat. <laughs> well, this is that system, the Fujitsu Gyuho cow step service on Microsoft Azure. So the step count data from those parameters is sent over a wireless receiver and over the internet to Azure. There's a service on Azure 
which analyzes the data and produces alerts for the farmer on his mobile phone for each cow. So when the cow goes into heat, the farmer gets an alert, and he can act on it. And so there's a secret to that. Uh, data scientists will like it. I'll tell, let me tell you what that is. So the x-axis on that graph is the time of night. Y-axis is the number of steps the cow is taking, OK? So this is a normal cow on a normal night, you know, sort of just walking around a little bit, lying down, and so on. Let's see what happens when the animal goes into heat. Uh, the number of steps the animal takes just shot up, way up, right? And that's the start of estrus. And it's a 95% accurate detection. All you have to do is an year over year, uh, no, no, day over day, count of the number of steps being taken in an hour by the animal uh, at the same time, and you can get a pretty accurate detection. They do a little bit more than that, but you can get a very good accurate detection. The optimal time for artificial insemination, for maximum consumption rate, is 16 hours after that. That's when AI meets AI, artificial insemination, that is. <laughs> <laughs> now, Fujitsu researchers found another fascinating thing. There's a window of time around that 16 hours. If you perform artificial insemination the first four hours, you're likely to get a female. And if you perform artificial insemination the second four hours, you're likely to get a male calf. Amazing, with 70% probability, by the way. It's not all exact, but now the farmer has an amazing control which he can use to, uh, uh, to decide whether to have more females or males for milk or beef. And Fujitsu's researchers found even more amazing things when uh, analyzing that pedometer data. They found uh, that they could detect about eight different diseases of cows. Because when cows have different diseases, they have different patterns of restlessness and uh, times of co coisins and so on. So they can detect about eight different diseases. And then, remember, I said that this is about 95% accurate? That 5% that are false positive, that turns out to be meaningful as well. Some of that is when the cow skips the farm and runs away. Important to detect as well. <clears throat> now, uh, this, by the way, as many of you developers know, it's not necessarily overly sophisticated. This kind of a system with today's cloud-based services most, many of you can actually build in hours. And the power of the cloud is that once you build a service like that, you can make it global with very, very little effort. So when you build something amazing, when you discover something very interesting like that in data, the time from discovering that to having a product that's global and distributed and even farmers all over the world can use is extremely short. That's the agility and magic of the cloud. Now, uh, I thought this was a great story, and then we went to Israel. And we found that the Israelis had taken this to a whole new level. By the way, Israel has the world's largest uh, per capita production of milk, three times what any other country uh, achieves, all through the use of technology. That's really, literally, an internet of cows. <laughs> and here are some of the companies that are doing it. Here is a company called SCR that provides a whole herd management uh, tool with, uh, 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 with great dashboards on your mobile phones. There is a company called uh, uh, Affy Milk that does actually significant optimization of the entire process from milking to actually uh, creating, you know, making cheese and dairy products and how to make it in the most optimal fashion. And they are again using the cloud. By the way, these are all cloud partners. Um, and yet another one is ACOL, which is uh, uh, Israel's dairy network. And they cover all of these things, growers and farmers, quality, dairy cooperatives, treatment, suppliers, all of that using cloud and cloud-based data. Because cloud enables incredible distribution abilities, right? Imagine dairy farmers. They don't want to maintain servers. They don't want to program things. They just want a service. And you can now build services that reach to every part of the world's economy and revolutionize it. That is the power of the cloud. In fact, you know, dairies are literally milking the cloud. OK, so <clears throat> let's step back now, back to the thread of conversation. So now let's talk about real-time analytics. So um, connected data, by the way, is not only massive these days. It's constantly in motion. The natural state, by the way, of data now is in motion. It's not on tape sitting still. 
And data is from sensors, from websites, from apps in the cloud, from social apps, new types of data being created every day, and it's streaming over the wire. And developers like you want to easily process that data in real time and get insights they can use. So let's take an example of a solution that does that on Azure, okay, an example demo in this case, and you said to illustrate the power of developing in the cloud. Now, how, how many of you have seen HowOld.net? Out of curiosity? Okay, good, uh, some of you. Uh, this was a demo that I created for a talk in April. Uh, it's called you know, uh, HowOld.net demo, and we'll, we will see what that is. So we're going to show you that demo, and you're all going to actually bring the data in motion to see if we can make a difference, right? So take out your phones. It's OK. Just keep them in, uh, in a silent mode. But let's see if you can go to the URL, how oldnet and I'll uh, talk about this. So we built this app using some of the intelligent APIs we have in the cloud, right? So we have APIs in the gallery, Azure ML gallery, for face detection, for vision, for speech, for text analytics. So uh, by the way, to explain all of this, I have my partner in crime, Chris. I want to say Chris Rock, but Chris is Chris Wilcox. But, uh, so Chris is going to help me uh, do this demo with me. Uh, so Chris, uh, let's see that face API. So the face API allows you to go analyze, detect faces and images, analyze them, and actually detect uh, uh, the age and gender. Uh, from faces, okay, face images. So let's now go uh, build, bring that site, howold.net. We actually created a fun application with that. So uh, let's, uh, let's actually uh, take a look at a couple of pictures in there. So Chris just uh, took a picture of that beautiful family. Uh, the, uh, you, know, you can see it detected the age and gender of people in that picture. You know, the grandpa looks about 73, uh, the uh, kids look about 15 and seven. You know, very nice. So Chris, I mean, can we take some picture from the web? Uh, let's say Mona Lisa, and let's see how old she looks. So, uh, so uh, she is 24. Uh, in fact, when Leonardo painted that model, she was actually about 24. Um, so why don't you all take some selfies or pictures, try and uploading it, okay, and you know, see if it's working for you. So let's, uh, Chris, let's take some picture and uh, try it out. So that's, by the way, the team that built HowOld.net. Took them only a couple of days of work, really, to actually build it. And so 34, 35, 30. Now, it's lying about Coram. He's a chief developer. He's actually about 37. But you know, hey, he, it's about how old he looks in that picture. And we can see that now if Chris uploads this picture. Chris, I think you have a fun picture up there. So this is Chris, same age, with a beard, without a beard. Well, so, you know, he talked to his wife yesterday. His wife confirmed that he actually, indeed, to her, looks 12 when he's not. <laughs> well, so try this. And so the thing is, um, what we are doing with this uh, is we actually are collecting a lot of the data from that website to, sh uh, to build analytics on top of it. So we have, you know, JSON uh, being captured from it. Uh, so. Yeah, let's, see, let's actually show the kind of data. We, we are collecting the user agent string, we are collecting the date and time, we have got the location, the latitude and longitude, uh, and of course the age that is being collected. And so that live data is being captured uh, as we speak. And we're showing it on a dashboard. Okay, so let's go to the dashboard. Uh, so the, this is a, uh, the live dashboard. By the way, let's go to the top, uh, by the way. So this, uh, we've had 78.5 million users use that site from the time we launched in April. Uh, we had 552 million photos uploaded. It went viral on Twitter, by the way, as we did it. Uh, and number of faces uh, in the last uh, 60 uh, seconds is 315. So actually, you know, you might be able to make a difference if you actually just tried it all at once. You might see that actually move, that graph, uh, that faces by browser move. Um, maybe, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Uh, okay, so let's, let's take that uh, dashboard. Uh, uh, Chris, can you click into that? Maybe you can ask a natural language question. This dashboard allows you to ask questions in natural language. This is a Power BI dashboard hosted on Azure. 
Okay? It allows you to take in data. You know, oh, he said, yeah, number of faces in the last 120 seconds by browser and data in a bar chart, you got a bar chart. The power of Power BI as a service is that you can interact with all of that data in natural language. It makes it very easy for a business user. Now, it's not oriented necessarily for developers. There are two scenarios, uh, producing dashboards for business users and producing dashboards uh, when you and I are developing things. When you're developing things, you want something much more interactive, of course. But this is a great tool. And that, by the way, is the locations from which people are actually uh, uploading faces. So now let's go back. Uh, let's go back and look at that live uh, streaming chart. Uh, yeah, so that dashboard that is live, faces by browser, um, you know, it's actually uh, the number of faces being uploaded from every type of browser. Now, people like you know how hard it is to create those kinds of live dashboards, right? live data streaming in, and uh, you want the graphs to move, and all of that. It's actually a lot of coding. Now, we have great services in Azure that simplifies it, fully managed services. There's a service called Azure Stream Analytics, okay? And the way we build these things is we bring data through Event Hubs. Event Hubs allows you to ingest streaming data. It's a fully managed service on the cloud. You don't have to install any software. You just write to it. Data comes into the cloud. And then from Event Hubs, you can use Azure Stream Analytics, to configure standing queries in the stream of data that produce those kind of analysis that you can plot in Power BI. Okay, and let's show you that query. And what's magical about stream analytics is how simple it makes that code. So this is the uh, code that just aggregates the computation for that streaming dashboard. Basically counting, you know, you can, you, you can all understand it. It's eight lines of code to count uh, for each browser type the number of faces being uploaded from the stream input aggregated it over a 10 second time window using a hopping window, okay? Eight lines of code and you have that aggregation done. Imagine how many lines of code it will take in Java and Storm. It's actually about you know, several hundreds of lines. In, even in Python it will take quite a lot of coding and you let it compile and run it and so on and set up. You don't have to do any of that. So this is in a streaming data, you're able to actually just put the query in and it will just work. Okay, so that's the magic of streaming analytics. So, um, now, look, we started by talking about data in motion. And what you've just seen is how you can analyze data in motion with stream analytics and build great dashboards with Power BI. All of that in a very, very short time frame if you know what you're doing. Okay, it's incredibly powerful. So we have covered real-time analytics. Now let's talk about predictive analytics. So, uh, this is the other uh, greatest area of interest, machine learning, predictive analytics, and all of that. By the way, let me ask this audience a question. How many of you know who invented the least squares algorithm that is so fundamental to regression and predictive analytics? Okay, in the back. Gauss. Gauss at what age? Yeah, he was, he, in front, he said he was 17, it's actually 18. <laughs> You know, in the, back in the 18th century, he was 18 years old. And what was the big data he was studying at that time? Anybody know? Height. What? Height. No. Uh, he was, okay, go back there. Yes, what? He was tracking a comet. Actually, that was not true. What he was just doing, <laughs> he, was, he, he, he was just looking at planetary motion. He was just looking into the sky. He had all the data points of where the planets were at different times of the year, and he wanted to actually figure out what the path these planets were following. So you had to do a least squares fit. And he invented the least squares algorithm at the tender age of 18. He was curious and he was smart. And so now what's happened these days is because we have so much amazing data being collected from every aspect of our lives, you can apply even simple statistical techniques, but you have to do it at scale, and you can get magical results out of that. Now, uh, we have, uh, in, you know, in February, we have a service called Azure Machine Learning that we announced as general availability, right? It is uh, a state-of-the-art service, all fully managed in the cloud, that allows incredibly comprehensive machine learning models to be built, and not only can you build them in the cloud, but you can deploy them as APIs. And that's incredibly important. Now, how many of you actually do data science for a living? Okay, a lot of you do. 
most of you, I bet, believe that the hardest thing in data science is actually doing the data wrangling, right? Bringing the data in and you know understanding what works. And by the way, I've done data science for 20 years uh, as well, and I agree that that is actually hard. But think about deploying a machine learning model that you build in production at scale in an app and managing it and maintaining it and how much work that is. The vast majority of data scientists today actually don't have to deal with that struggle because they outsource it to IT and it takes them months to do it. And unless you have already built in your enterprise a great architecture for managing machine learning models and ways to update it and ways to actually audit it and ways to do A-B testing and ways to do champion challenger. And if you haven't done all of that, if you've done all of that, yeah, okay. You have a better infrastructure, but that's hard work. Most people can't do that. Now, what we have done with Azure Machine Learning is made it incredibly simple to build machine learning models and publish it as a web service API, all hosted in the cloud. It runs in the cloud, and it's actually extremely easy to integrate it into applications, okay? So again, the best way for me to tell you and show you this is through a story. Now, for those of you who are sort of from outside the US, there is something called March Madness that happens in March here in, in the US. It's the NCAA college, uh, college basketball games. And it's a time when Americans love to gamble. Uh, everyone has a prediction about who's going to win. And people actually make serious bets. Um, and it, it feels like everyone has a, uh, has a prediction to make. Uh, even you know, our own president, who has uh, created a great bracket, uh, uh, Satya Nadella, our CEO, uh, actually, he surprised the world sort of by picking March Madness winners better than Bing and better than most people. Now, uh, Google had predictions, Bing had predictions, now Satya had predictions. Satya had, by the way, help. Uh, help from people, data scientists and people who knew basketball. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I want to now tell you a story about Adam Garland. Adam Garland is a developer in Office. Okay? He, didn't know very much about basketball, but he thought it would be actually really fun to use a hackathon we had kicked off at that time. Okay, we had done a March Madness competition around Azure ML. He thought it would be fun to use that as an opportunity to learn machine learning. And within a few hours, he had taken the data set of teams that were competing and winning, and he had built a great predictive model. And he refined it a little bit, and he did much better than Google's predictions, Bing's predictions, and even Satya's predictions. He came absolutely number one. And it was not just him. Many of the people who participated in our internal hackathon, they, more, a lot of them came fairly close to the top. You see all those machine learning things. Uh, and they, they came uh, pretty high up in the ranks. And so I thought it might be actually fun to show you what Adam Garland did and recreate what he did so that uh, you can see how easy it is to make that happen. So to predict if a team will win or lose, typically I need a binary classifier, okay? So I'm going to say two teams, which one will win? Will the team one win or not, okay? Let's start with a sample from the Azure ML Gallery. Chris is doing that now. And let's open that in studio. So the thing about, by the way, the gallery is there are lots of sample experiments there that can be with a click opened in the Azure ML Studio, and it's live, ready for, to be run. So this is a classic uh, uh, workflow for a binary classifier. You can see it's very simple. You read the data, you clean the missing data, you select the columns you want. Then there is a two-class boosted decision tree that we are going to train, okay? And then we're going to score the model with that trained uh, two-class boosted decision tree and evaluate the model. Very simple workflow for a typical binary classifier, it's there. If you wanted to modify that, you can modify that too. So Chris, let's run it. Let's just uh, run it uh, if you can. Sure. Yeah. Let's, uh, yeah, so we can easily modify that workflow, bring in the NCAA historical matches, right? He can modify that, put that in, and he just ran that workflow. Uh, and while that's running, let's go look at the data. We can actually click on the data set and visualize it. And so this is the historical data on matches, 20 years of basketball games. And it shows you, hey, the teams that played each other, 
Um, you know, the stats, when it clicks on score one, it shows the statistics on that one. If you scroll a little bit to the right on the left table, yeah, you can see the other types of data. It's basically very simple data. So two teams played each other, and the last column says whether team one won or not, okay? And so you get a true-false. That's your target that you're trying to predict. Extremely simple data for now. So let's go back and see how this model performed. So that experiment ran. And now when you visualize it, you will see the ROC curve. The ROC curve uh, shows how good it is. Uh, we have got about a 63% uh, area uh, accuracy in prediction, okay? Not too bad for that kind of sparse data. All you have is matches that have been played. Okay, so that's what you have. So now let's go back and see what Adam did. Adam actually did something a little bit more after doing that first thing. He brought in uh, more data. He brought in team performance and average annual team stats. So there were historical matches, and he then br brought in team stats and merged them. And uh, he uh, joined them with a little bit of SQL. He also did a two-class boosted decision tree. The two-class, actually, uh, decision jungle. Two-class decision jungle. And then uh, he did a sweeping of parameters. He tried all the parameters available. He ran a sweep, and then he picked the best. Okay, so that's what he did. So again, uh, uh, let's run it. But uh, while uh, let's now actually go look at that data in a way that is more familiar to many of you using a Python notebook. So what we're going to actually show is actually something pretty cool. Now, Sharok and team here built a great IPython notebook service on Azure. It's fully hosted. Okay, you don't. It's not actually going to run on a laptop. It's fully integrated in Azure ML. You can actually fire up an IPython notebook from any of those nodes in the graph, bring that data up, and interact with it. So I'm going to actually let Chris now go solo and show us the magic of the IPython notebook hosted in Azure. So I've already opened the notebook here. And by default, we give you the first cell filled in. So what we've done is we've used an Azure ML Python package that's up on Pipey right now pulled in your workspace ID as well as authorization token, and given you the data set as a pandas data frame. So we can run this. It's going to download the data into this uh, Jupyter notebook. We can visualize the frame. Now, for those of you that don't know what a data frame is in pandas, you can always put a question mark after it. We can control enter. We'll get some helpful information that'll kind of give us an idea of the shape of our data and some information on how we use a pandas data frame. We also have an all right uh, IntelliSense setup where we can describe, and that's what I wanted to do. So we're gonna go ahead and describe this data. I'm gonna collapse the help here. And we now can see some statistical information about the different data columns we have. We can also do things like filter the data a bit. So I'm interested in my favorite team which is Wisconsin, so we're, that's where I come from. And so we can now see wherever the team is Wisconsin, we can see all of their stats over the years and sort of get an idea of what kind of play they do. We can also easily plot the information. We can say, let's do team on the x-axis and let's do score on the other. And we can kind of get an idea of where an average basketball score might lie. We can see it's pretty level across the whole thing. And this is really the tip of the iceberg, what you can do with a Jupyter Notebook. This already has over 300 packages. It's using an Anaconda distro already for you. So you can do scikit-learn, you can use NumPy, you can use Pandas, all the tools you're familiar with in the cloud, in the same data center as your data. It'll be faster, it'll be cheaper, and it's a great playground. It's, it's really fun. Yeah, and Jupyter Notebooks here, by the way, in the future will include R in it, we will actually uh, have other kernels that work in it. So this is going to provide an incredible REPL environment right there in the cloud, right next to the data, so that uh, data scientists can very, very easily interact with the data, create the models. Uh, then, of course, the next big step is actually to deploy the models in the cloud. So let me actually uh, show you uh, how to actually deploy the model in the cloud. So Chris, so let's go. Um, publish this as a web service. Yeah. Yep. So 
what he did is he <laughs> clicked upon set up as a web service, and automatically that graph transformed itself to a sample that you would use to publish an API. Remember, when you're actually publishing an application, it's not the same workflow as the modeling workflow. You need to take the model that is trained. In this particular case, the model became at, at the top left. Yeah, that's the model. Um, and then, uh, right, and then you have the web service input, the data transformations happen, the trained model is picked up, you're using the scoring with it, and Chris, if you scroll down, you'll see uh, then the web service output, right? So the, on the left here, the, this became, this is the model, you're scoring the model, and you're providing the web service output, right? So this is a scoring workflow. So you can go from a modeling workflow or the experimentation workflow to a scoring workflow, and you can modify that. You can actually bring in other modules. If you wanted to put in an execute Python module right in there that does some transformations, additional transformations, and especially take the score and do additional transformations and combine it with other information, you can put that all in there before you actually uh, pump it to the web service output. So now, Azure ML allows you to build a complete ML application. It's not about just an experimentation platform. It allows you to create a complete ML application and create a an web hosted, a cloud hosted API using this, right? So now let's actually publish the web service. And when Chris publishes the web service, a live API is being created in Azure. And it is hosted in the, uh, it's a REST API. It's hosted, it has all data interfaces. You just saw that happen. This is all it took to publish a, an API in the cloud. It's elastic, it is scalable, it's ready to be integrated in applications. It can be run, called from mobile phones, can be called from Python notebooks, can be called from anywhere. So that changes the game, by the way, in operationalization production. By the way, this also is the best tool that I know of, or the fastest tool I know of, for you to operationalize Python code. Remember, it doesn't have to be machine learning. You can bring in arbitrary Python code, put that into an execute Python script, and go through that workflow and publish an API, and a Python code is hosted in the cloud and ready to be integrated and called in from applications. So now, um, that API key is shown right there at the top. Let's go look at a help page, Chris. Uh, yeah, that's the API key. Let's go, uh, there's a help page that shows you how to call this. So if you see, you'll see the URL of that REST API. If you go scroll all the way down, uh, you will see the sample code. You will see the sample code in, um, uh, in all the way down. Yep. It's fairly close, there you go. So you have, we, have, we automatically generate sample code in C-sharp, in Python. If you click Python, you will see the sample code. You, know, you can basically see the API key there. Here there is ABC123. If you replace that with that key that was shown, you can actually execute and call that, right? And so let's now actually do that. Chris, why don't we just bring up an iPod, uh, a Jupyter notebook and uh, show how to actually call that web service live. Sure. So I'm going to go back here to the machine learning homepage here. And we have a notebooks tab, and I have a notebook for consuming a service. The nice thing about the machine learning environment, too, is you don't always have to be in Jupyter to see them. Anytime you log into Studio, any notebook you've opened before will be listed there with a timestamp who created it. And you can also share these around within workspaces. So here we have some basic code. We use, again, the Azure ML library we've published. And there are some handy decorators we can use to make a team one wins function. So here we can provide the API URL and key. We provide the types that are needed, so we're going to need a round, a seed and team ID for each team playing. We need to know the input name, which in this case is match, and the output name, which is prediction. And we can provide an empty method, and we'll take care of it for you. So let's run this. And then down here, we're going to call team one wins, and in round six of the 2015 Final Four, Duke and Wisconsin played each other. They're both the first seed. I'm going to do some string formatting here. And we're going to see who won and how sure the algorithm is of it. And so it says Duke wins with a probability of 54%. How do you feel about that, Chris? Less than good. Um, <laughs> but it's only 54. I mean, just slightly over uh, even odds. But that's exactly what Adam Garland did. I mean, he built that model. He predicted Duke would win. And he scored the highest in the rank, in the, in the hackathon. Um, so this is, again, the magic of the cloud-hosted operationalization and development. 
So you saw how we went all the way from data to a finished web service that can be integrated into any web API, into any website, into mobile applications, into Jupyter Notebooks, and get results. So these Jupyter Notebooks, by the way, uh, if you go to Azure ML Studio, can we actually go back to Azure ML Studio, Chris? And you know, can you actually select the Notebooks tab? And so this is the Notebooks tab. You can see the Notebooks that you have created. If you click plus new, by the way, down below, uh, you can actually see Notebooks. You can start with different kinds of Notebooks. So remember, these Notebooks are actually saved in Azure ML Studio. So you can create experiments using Notebooks, save them, and that's all there. It's actually pretty magical. You can have a pretty complex experiment all set up in the notebook, and you, I can save them, you can share them, and so on. So this is actually a great feature. So now let's, um, let's go back. It's, uh, uh, now, let's step back to the slides. So I just want to step back a little bit, and we showed you with operationalization how to go create something that can be integrated into applications. When you think about going from data to actions, uh, there are typically several things that people want to do. You know, first, people ask when they see the data, what happened, okay, in the past. And then they think about what happened a little bit. There's a manual process that you go through before you make a decision on the data and drive some action, okay? If you're a little bit smarter, statistically smarter, and you have some data scientists, you will actually go up and say, hey, why did that thing happen? Okay, you're going beyond business intelligence slice and dice. You're actually asking why it happened. And then you actually think on it a little bit and say, hey, okay, knowing now why it happened, I'm going to actually take a decision and then drive an action. Now, actually what you need to do a little bit more if you're intelligent is to model what will happen using data and using scientific method. You, in fact, using A-B testing and appropriate to validate the process. Then you take, um, hey, more informed decisions because you know what the future is like. And then if you're really smart, you're going to expect the algorithms uh, to tell you what you should do. Ideally, you want a prescription. You actually get a recipe. And then you can actually go straight to the decision or action or create automated systems that go end to end and drive a completely automated intelligent process. That's the ultimate goal of all of the intelligent apps that we build you want actually a complete process to be intelligent, okay? Cool, so enter the quota and analytics suite. When we thought about all of what it takes to go from data to intelligent action, we felt we really had to bring together a lot of different components. It was not just about machine learning and putting a web service in the cloud, that is an important piece of it, but there's a lot more required. You need information management. You need to be able to bring data in from a wide variety of sources very simply and easily. And information integration, by the way, is key to intelligence. Most smart applications become smart not just because of the power of one algorithm. It's not deep neural networks that will create intelligence, for example. It's when you bring lots of different types of data together, combine them together, and apply algorithms on top of the integrated data. And so to do a lot of that, by the way, you do need great big data stores. So we have Azure uh, has a number of big data stores. And then machine learning and analytics, and a lot of you, as you saw, would also want powerful dashboards and visualizations and pre-configured solutions on top. And we also had great technology for perceptual intelligence. And why is that important? If you think about most of the data that's being created in the world today, a lot of that is completely unstructured data. It is images, it is face data, it is uh, speech and video, and it's data from sensors. So you want to be able to manage all of that. And not only that, you use all of that intelligently, but when you actually build an application, wouldn't it be nice if you had an intelligent interface to that? An interface with which you could ask questions in natural language instead of typing SQL queries or writing Python code. An interface that was proactive and could alert you when something happens in the data, an interface that actually allowed uh, you to configure smart things that you want to get to know and understood the context in which you are asking questions. And that's Cortana. Cortana is, a, you know, is, is Microsoft's personal digital assistant. It's on Windows phones now, but very soon it'll be on every Windows 10 machine. We're going to have a billion um, a billion laptops in about two to three years that have Cortana on it. Can you use Cortana, the interface, to interact with enterprise data? 
And so when we brought all of these things together, we also realized we could integrate them with great solutions, templates, and so on. That's a Cortana analytics suite, okay? So uh, here are a lot, all the components in it. Remember, analytics is actually a lot of different things. We have brought in you know, things like Azure Data Factory that allows you to orchestrate data movement across different services and fire off different services. We have Azure Data Catalog to catalog the data. We have big data stores like Azure Data Lake and SQL Data Warehouse in which you can do big data computation. We have machine learning and analytics. And we have dashboards and visualizations. It's a lot of components, but integrated as a suite with templates, recipes, and uh, solutions. The best way for me to, again, illustrate this and show you the power of it is by taking a real-world application. Okay? We are working with the Dartmouth Hitchcock Hospital. And I'll tell, let the customer the tell the story. The system is challenged by the task to deliver exceptional, personalized care at a lower cost. Despite spending nearly one-fifth of our gross domestic product on healthcare, we struggle to meet this goal. Financial pressures on care providers are increasing. This isn't sustainable. So how can we deliver high-quality, personalized care that patients deserve, given the cost pressures we face? At Dartmouth Hitchcock, we've created Imagine Care, a new cloud-based solution built on Cortana Analytics Suite and Microsoft Dynamics that enables providers to help patients achieve better health. With the help of Microsoft, Dartmouth Hitchcock is building a technology platform to serve healthcare organizations and patients across the country, setting a new standard for personalized care. Now, using machine intelligence, providers can develop a care plan that's unique to each patient. We can monitor patients from their homes, where data is collected from devices and sent to the cloud, to Imagine Care's 24-7 contact center, where registered nurses continually monitor a patient's health status and potentially serious trends. Cortana, summarize health status for Ben Andrews. Ben Andrews' weight has increased more than two pounds in the last 24 hours. Please review the home diuresis protocol prescribed by Dr. Phillips. Patients get reminders and encouragement and dynamic updates to their care plans, improving their health, helping them avoid unnecessary trips to the emergency room, and reducing the cost of care. With support from loved ones and real-time interventions, there is less likelihood of readmission. With Cortana Analytics Suite and Microsoft Dynamics, we're transforming the way healthcare is delivered today, improving patient outcomes, reducing costs, and offering an unprecedented level of personalized care. Uh, remember, every hospital these days is a data company too. Hospitals traditionally have used uh, all types of mechanisms to treat patients after they've had an incident. In the future, the world is going to be different. You're going to use data from the Internet of Things, from blood pressure monitors that are connected to services in the cloud, to be able to actually predict when an event will happen. And you can have proactive healthcare to avoid unnecessary emergency room admissions <laughs> and unnecessary things that you can actually totally prevent. It's preventive healthcare. In fact, in the future, data will be the thing that changes the healthcare, healthcare system the most. By the way, this is not new. Anybody know who the world's first female data scientist was? Anybody in the audience? Yes? Not Ada Lovelace. It was actually, go ahead, Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale, Florence Nightingale uh, used data from hospital conditions during the Crimean War. She created the very first circular histogram, by the way, and showed that more people died of hospital infections than in the battlefield. And that was the primary driver for sanitation in hospitals, the big change that happened for sanitation in hospitals. And for that, she was elected to the Royal Statistical Society in the 1930s and became an honorary statistician. Ah, so the, the power of data was evident even then. And in the future, the power of data with predictive analytics is going to change our lives. So big data and analytics can truly change lives. OK. So here's what's happening now with the intelligent cloud. Right? The magic of the cloud is the agility it gives developers and the integration of data from all sorts of sources. 
So the cloud has turned hardware into software. You don't have to worry about hardware installation and management and all of those. It's available as a service. Hardware is available as a service. It turns software into services. You don't have to worry about installation of software, version control, and licensing, and all of those. It also turns data into intelligence. It makes you smart, it sets you free, and it allows you to go as fast as you could possibly go. So let me conclude with a story, a final story uh, that in many ways captures the spirit of what we are trying to do. This is a story of North American Eagle. And there's a young man in the video that I'm about to show you. He's 20 years old. He's a sophomore at UW. He started in this project at age 16, and he is using data to break land speed records. So let me play that video, and it'll show you what it means. Race mile one, going in the afternoons. It's human nature to go as fast as you can possibly go. Oh, Lord. I'm not afraid of dying. I don't want to die, but I'm not afraid of it. I've been waiting for this moment for all my life. I just go, and I don't let up until I have to. On the Eagle, there's over 30 sensors. They gather almost 12 million points of data. We want to figure out the best way in which for this car to run. Enter the Microsoft Cloud. We're able to take the data, automatically process it, and get the results in a time frame that was unimaginable in the past. If you start thinking with fear, you're going to be living with fear, and you're not going to be achieving the goals that you set for yourself. Two things that I'm thinking before I take off. Let this be a testament that girls can do anything they set their mind to, and do not wreck this car. We're processing over 2,000 measurements a second, and that's where machine learning comes in. We're going to be able to try to find the correlations that are probably not obvious, and drive this project to a greater extent than we ever could have dreamed. We will make history in 2015. Thank you all. It's going to be a great conference. Should I take one or two questions, or is it, we are late on time, I think?